prophecy that went forth maybe 10 or 12 years ago when God began to uh, share uh, his mystery with a couple of the noble TV evangelists like Joyce Myers, Paula White, um, Cleo Dollar. They all began to see this army that God was raising up. But this army that God was raising up wasn't being raised in the college or on the battleground. This army that God was raising up was being raised up in incarceration, jails, prisons, uh, mental homes, etc. To now begin to introduce these men and these women of God that they prophesied would come over a decade ago. I mean, I had, you know, I went in prison and I think I was about 28. I came home when I was 67 or something like that. But like, uh, you know, like, 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 like I said, I stayed in prison decade after decade. I actually spent 39 years in prison. And some of that was on death row. Well, today we'll be interviewing Edward Moten. Uh, he's going to give you his testimony. Um, if you remember, a couple of months ago, I gave you my testimony about the 20 years I did incarcerated and the effect it had not only on me, but my family members and the institutions. He's going to give you his testimony. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this day, this opportunity, Lord God, for granting us the grace to live another day. Lord God, as we come before you, we ask you, Lord God, that the words, the testimony shared today will minister to the hearers, Lord God. If that it will give grace, Father God, Lord, to them, Father God, that are hearkening unto what the Spirit is saying, Lord God. We pray, Father God, through our experience and through our testimony that we'll be able to reach the, the, the youth, Lord God. Lord, Father God, not only youth, but them that are willing to hear. And God, we just give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Be glorified forevermore. Amen. Amen. Uh, Mr. Moton. I would like for you to speak to the audience and share with them your testimony and what all you experienced and what all you went through on the opposite side of the fence. Okay, first of all, I'm originally from Miami, Florida. And I went out to California when I was in the Air Force. Uh, you know, California prison system is full of gangs. And I was no different. You know, I was uh, part of the MA population. And at that time, it was a lot of racial strife. And people were normally hung with their own uh, nationality. So a black guy to roll with the blacks. And in California, you know, when they say, uh, you know, you uh, have a life prison term, that's what it means. You know, like I was uh, convicted of a second degree murder, which carries 15 years to life in state prison. And I say 15 years to life life being the optimal uh, term that you will likely do if you continue uh, with the adverse behavior while you are incarcerated. Okay, uh, prior to me being uh, sentenced in prison, I was already placed there. California have a law, uh, it's Penal Code Section 4006, of 4007 is one of the two or maybe the combination of both. Those statutes allow a judge to, to place you in prison prior to having a trial. So I was placed up under those statutes and I was uh, placed in the worst prison in California at the time, Folsom Prison which is located in Northern California. You know, I mean, that was the worst prison. And not only that, I couldn't hang with, you know, well, be placed with those that was in general population because I wasn't sentenced. So I was housed in the security housing unit, which is known as the whole. And I was housed with the worst, or the worst prison in California prison system. I stayed there for possibly 18 months. Then I was transferred up to San Quentin. Uh, you know, most people have heard about San Quentin, you know, even down here. It's just one of the most worst prisons in the United States. So I was transferred there, still without a trial. And I was housed on a place they call Death Row Overflow. So you can understand what I'm uh, talking about. Death Row Overflow is a place that they house 
people that's condemned to die, that they don't have space on the regular death row to place them because you know the regular death row is already crowded, so it has a, a, another unit that they place people that's also waiting to die, and we you know uh, that place is called death row overflow. I was out there, you know, with, you know, with a, a lot of people that was condemned to die, and I had yet been given a trial date or anything. Folsom, San Quentin, man, it, it gave you, uh, you know, like a, um, a better understanding as to what the two places was. In 1982 through 1984, they had more stabbings and more killings in those two institutions than any time in the history of them prisons. And, and uh, one of them was around, since the, both of them were around, I think, since the 1800s. So, they, in 82 to 84, two year span, they had more stabbing, more killing than any time in the history of those prisons, man. And uh, every day somebody got stabbed, maybe uh, every other day somebody died, or maybe twice a day or something. You know, it, I mean, it was bad like that for two years. And I was in that kind of environment and was thriving. I was thriving. I was, I mean, to be honest, I was enjoying a lot of it because. I had written myself off. I'm in prison on death row overflow. I hadn't had a trial. And in my head, I'm saying, okay, they got me here on death row overflow and I haven't had a trial. They intend to gas me. You know, they had the gas chamber back then. Right. I was, uh, you know, going to the yard with all the regulars, you know, to the exercise yard, you know, with all the regulars. And I, you know, uh, like I said, I didn't have. Uh, you know, a, a prison term at that point or anything else. And it was like surreal because everyone there was waiting to be executed and I was waiting to have a trial. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there roughly three and a half years on death row overflow. Uh, caught up in the same thing and death row prisoners were caught up with, you know, and that's the violence on the yard being, you know, uh, clashes on the yard, you know, you get prison gangs clashing, you know, we stabbing each other, getting shot at, you know, like, it's like the, those yards there are like a picture of fish bowl, you know, you have fish in a little bowl, and on the rim of this bowl you have prison guards with uh, many 14s pointing down into the little fishbowl. There's nowhere to go in the fishbowl. Bullets hit the wall and just ricochet uh, and, you know, hit any and everybody. So it was just like, you know, uh, being in a little small area and people just shooting and bullets hitting cement, just ricocheting anywhere, hitting people that wasn't even involved in the ruckus, but they were <laughs> involved in saying Quinkle was just housed there. So, you know, like that went on for, a, you know, a long time off and on. You know, like I was uh, deemed a gang member, you know, one of the worst gangs at that time in the system. You know, I mean, the, the absolute worst. You know, they used, you know, like they just wouldn't stab up inmates. They would kill prison guards too. So, um, so the audience should know, and this is real, um, you may go down, you know, I speak this in, a test in the form of a testimony as one of the most dangerous inmates in California prison system. I was housed among some, I don't know what I, man, they, man, they got some real, real monsters, man. They got, I mean, they got guys worse than me, a lot worse than I am. But I, you know, I felt comfortable around them. I survived around them for eons, a long time. I stayed in the hole uh, about 11 years the first time. Stayed in the, in the administrative segregation, the SHU, security housing unit, for 11 straight years at one time. And, 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 you know, it was just, you know, it was just time, you know, for me. You know? What was the name that they gave you in there? Oh, uh, St. Coop. Say cool. Uh, yeah, that's why he's for intelligent fighter. Yeah. 
and now you fight for God. Yeah, I fight for God. <laughs> Oh, Only do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, like, he turn you around. Yeah. You know, all you gotta do is listen. Yeah. Do is listen, man. They yeah. referred me out to a county jail, uh, Oakland County Jail, and then uh, Alameda County Jail in Oakland, California. And I, you know, uh, they put me there, but they placed me in the hole also in the county jail. So again, I'm, you know, I'm amongst the worst prisoners who was housed in the county jail. Uh, at, uh, during this time, you know, I had a, a lawyer because I was facing the death penalty. Not one lawyer, I had two because by statute, when you're facing the death penalty, you are uh, afforded two lawyers. So, uh, I stayed in trial possibly three weeks. And, you know, like the jury kept coming back asking the judge, uh, can they find me something guilty of less than a death penalty? So he said, okay, uh, I'm taking the death penalty off the table. You guys have between uh, life without possibility of parole, first degree murder, which is 27 to life at the time, and second degree murder, which is 15 to life at the time. Those were the alternatives that the jury had to choose from. So they came back twice after that and asked them, can they find me guilty of something less than a uh, second degree murder, which is 15 to life. If the judge would have given them a, a permission to find me guilty of something less than a sec second degree murder, the next step down would have been a manslaughter. Mm -hmm. And no, you know, the judge or no, the prosecution wanted me to get manslaughter because I had manslaughter time in. From the time of, of my arrest to the time of my trial, I was in custody approximately seven years. And the judge, we set two release dates. One is the minimum, which mine was 1991, and the maximum they said I would serve was 1994. They said the only way I can uh, exceed 94 is to do something in prison that warrants me to be taken to the outside court and sentenced more time. That didn't happen. Uh, you know, I, I didn't go out to court and, and receive any more time. What happened was uh, incarceration became a business. And with that business, they needed bodies to fill and continue to fill up prisons. So you know, uh, I went to prison with the expectation in 1987 to be released in, in 1994. That was my, you know, my thinking at the time. When And somewhere in between 89 and 91, the laws changed. You know, the, the, you know, legislature, the legislature in California legislated new laws and uh, people that were supposed to not go to the board like second degree murders, we were then forced to go to the parole board, not for progress report hearings like we were told earlier, but to actually be found suitable for release. And with this came, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, that's a whole new set of circumstances because now we have to, you know, go to the parole board and it's solely left up to them when or if they ever release you. You know, okay, so we did that, you know, and I went to the board for a very, very long time, very long time, and I kept being told I wasn't going anywhere. And while I'm, you know, while I'm doing time year after year, decade after decade, uh, laws again change. So, you know, it's like if, if you're poor, you know, chances are you're gonna be there for a long time. Mm. You'll be there for a long time. Okay, but anyway, you know, my point is uh, that people of color, you know, and you know, and I use people of color or, or, or you know, just uh, poor people. I'm not just talking about black and brown people. I'm talking about 
anybody that lives below the poverty line and poverty is a issue that it's you know it, it doesn't deal with the ethnicity of a person it deals with the economic situation if you live on or below the poverty line you're a minority it doesn't matter your ethnicity you know so if you are uh, sitting up there and you you know you're poor you're not going to get any help you know no no major help but like uh you know like you know, like, like, like i said i stayed in prison decade after decade i actually spent 39 years in prison and some of that was on death row but you know after you being in prison for so long and you're doing so many things up in there you know not good thing but you know because with you know with me being in california and i'm being doing time in California prison and I'm from out of another state, you know, you're always running into stuff. You know, you always got to stand up and represent yourself, represent your, et you know, your ethnic group, because that's the way they flow out on the West Coast. You know, it's all about gangs and behind the wall, all about that. So, you know, like I was uh, deemed a gang member, you know, one of the worst gangs at that time in the system, you know, I mean, the, the absolute worst, you know, they used, you know, like they just wouldn't stab up inmates, they would kill prison guards too. You know, like the longer you stay in prison, the more you realize that what you're doing, whether you're part of the gang or not, you know, you tear down not just yourself, but you tear down everything around you the same way you were doing on the street. You know, it's the same mindset. You know, you come to prison because you're trying to get ahead financially, so you do what you think you have to do. When you get to prison, you want to maintain some kind of type of status quo, so you do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. But in time, you know, like you, you know, you know, like you have that, oh, you know, awakening. You know, that like you just say, hey, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. Then you, you know, that like you uh, go where well, I went through a period of, you know, reflection. And everything I was going through in prison, and uh, you know, one thing that struck me, you know, like it wasn't like I had some kind of light that flashed on in my head, uh, you know, nothing like that. It was more like just simple reflection. Well what made you do what you did. But when I think about all the crimes that I did commit, and I committed a lot, you know, not boasting anything, just a cold hard fact, I committed a lot. I understood that I hurt a lot of people in their process. And I know every time I, you know, be doing it, you know, before commission of a crime, I can remember this like it was yesterday. You know, like this little voice would just, tell me, you know, just, you know, a little, you know, that could, first it was, a, you know, a little louder, but through the years it got a little more dimmer because I would ignore it. But this voice would always say, you know, if you carry through with what you're thinking, you're going to be stuck, man. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to be stuck. And I don't know what the voice was early on, you know, because I, I wasn't a uh, Christ-centered person at the time, and I was worldly, mm -hmm. but I knew it was something that was trying to tell me, uh, or you know, give me a warning to adhere. But I always ignored it, you know. And the more crime I committed, the more uh, less vocal this voice became, or the more I ignored it. I don't know which it was, but I know. I was giving warning shots all the time, you know, and I just I ignored it. Mm -hmm. And when I became a little bit more spiritual, you know, started trying to understand not just me, but my environment and the world I live in, you know, and I started, you know, picking up my Bible too. And I started to understand that that little boy that was always inside of me trying to give me a warning I don't believe it was, was from this uh, earth, you know? I, I mean, I think it was something else because every time it tried to warn me and I could like hear it, wasn't nobody around me, I was by myself, 
You know, it just say, look, you you finna crash, dude. Don't do that. This was on the street before I ever came to prison. I had this, you know, you know, the voice on the inside of me, and it was prevalent also when I was inside finna do something idiotic. You know, say, look, man, you finna crash and burn on this. Don't do it. You know, so all I know is that I ignored it, and I'm kind of sure that there's a lot of people that get little warnings, you know, I mean, you know, every, you know, when God speak, it's not the same language to everybody. You know, you don't speak the same language to everybody because we don't have the same understanding. So he meets us, you know, wherever our understanding is, you know. And, uh, you know, like he relate to you on a level that you can understand, you know, that's mm -hmm. the best way I could put it. You know, but in time, you know, if, if you start listening to the voice, like I started actually listening to it, and this was way when I was like 28 years in prison, because I was hard-headed, and I know God took me through a lot, he had to, because I wasn't listening, you know, like I know that he had to get your attention mm -hmm. before, <laughs> you know, he can really talk to you and if he don't get your attention you know you're not going to be willing to listen so you know he knew I was stubborn hard-headed so that you know that you know he put me up on death row overflow he know I had to go there and even up there I was disobedient he knew it so that's why he put me there because he said okay I got to put him here because if I don't I'm not going to ever get this attention, you know, he's going to always function on his own will and not mine, you know, so, hey, I just, <laughs> you know, just start getting, you know, more, like I say, more spiritual, start listening, you know, to the, you know, this little voice inside of me and no longer ignoring it and I begin to like, you know, think better, you know, think different, you know, but this is what I do know. When I begin to think, change my thinking, I begin to change my perception on things, you know, because when you change your thinking, you also change the way you see things. And when you change the way you think and change the way you see things, guess what? You respond to things differently. So when I begin to think different, see things different, and respond different, I gravitated more toward the Bible than I ever did in my life. Not because I, you know, not out of fear or anything, but just out of curiosity. You know, what is there in this life beyond what I'm experiencing now? You know, it got to be something that's beyond this. And I hadn't found it out in no other way. You know, out of all the things I have tried, you know, I hadn't found out anything. And I, you know, like most people, the only time I, in prior in my life, the only time I would even think about God is when I, you know, when my back is all the way against the wall. You know, and I can't tell you how many times I have made promises because I've been in a lot of trouble throughout my life, a lot. You know, I tell God all the time, you know, trying to make a deal, money hard, let's make a deal. Look, if you get me out of this, I do everything you want me to do. Everything you know, you tell me to do through your word in the Bible. I, you know, I adhere to everything that's in the Bible. I did that in the '60s in Miami when I got in trouble in Dade County. Didn't keep a word of what I said. I went out to California got in trouble, said the same thing, Father, you get me out of this, I'll be your servant. Lied through the teeth, never <laughs> meant none of it, never did any of it. And this, you know, the last time when I got, got this murder beef, and I, it, it's God is my witness, that he could take the breath out of my body right this second if I committed the murder, I did not. Mm -hmm. But, I didn't even ask him to get me out of that because I know he wasn't. I done lied to him so many times, I didn't even want to go back. You know, I didn't even want to go back and say, Father, 
I'll do it this time. <laughs> I didn't have no faith in God having faith in me, you know. So I didn't even ask. I didn't even go there, you know. I said, okay, uh, you're on your own on this one, you know. <laughs> you're on your own, you know. But, you know, you know, as the Bible say, you know, God is, you know, God's a good God. You know, he know all things. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. And even when we think we got nothing coming, because I didn't think I had nothing coming, it wasn't coming fast, but it eventually came. And it came because I turned, you know, I flipped the script. I turned all the way around. I did a 180. Not a 360 going back the same way. I did a 180. Started going the opposite direction. And I didn't think I would ever leave prison, ever. You know, I mean, like I had been to the board about eight times, no, seven times, and for a whole decade, a whole ten years, I refused to go to the board, to the parole board, because I didn't think I would ever get out. You know, they kept telling me, you you know, you're not going anywhere. And, uh, and you know, how long I had, I mean, the length of time I've been in prison, it was like when I first started, you know, this prison term, when you go to the parole board, they had the options to give you a one, two, three, four, or five year denial before they see you again, you know, before they bring you back before them. I was in there so long till they changed all that up. You know, they started doing something uh, like three year denial, a five year denial, a seven, a 10, and a 15. They can choose any one of those numbers to bring you back before them. And oh, you know, and those wasn't, you know what, like to me, those wasn't, you know, like, uh, okay, I got a three year denial, a five year denial before I go, you know, have another chance to get out. To me, those was prison terms. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't get three and five and seven and ten and fifteen years sometimes for a, you yeah. know for a crime. So I viewed it as uh, you know additional prison term every time I got uh, denied parole. And I was at the point, and I remember it clearly too because I was so tired. You know, I mean, I had you know I went in prison, and I think I was about twenty-eight. I came home and I was 67 or something like that, you know, but I had got to the point that uh, I was tired and, you know, my prayer used to be, Father, you know, please get me out of here, you know, that you know your children's limitations, you know, that you know their limitations, all of, you know, each of us have different limitations. You know, I've almost reached my and I'm very, very close to the end here. Uh, just get me out. And I've been, you know, doing your will now for a better part of 10 years. 10 years of even, maybe even longer. But you know, I'm sincere about, you know, my prayers now because I, you know, I walk a different walk. I talk a different talk. So please get me out of here. Then I went to the parole board, I got a three year denial, I got another three, then I got a five year denial. After I got two threes, I got a five. And I hadn't done anything in prison. In fact I was you know, I mean they was talking about how you know, how good I was, you know, had had done. But as good as I was doing, that earned me a five year denial mm -hmm. from going home. So I, you know, I came back, you know, felt like my guts being kicked out. You know, I, you know, I started praying. And I said, Father, what do I have to do to, you know, to prove to you that I'm genuine? Everything I done did, I did for you. You know, I done left the prison games. I did that for you. I did, you know, at, at the risk of my own life, mm -hmm. I did that for you. Sometimes uh, when you lead a game, they mm -hmm. kill you. Uh, in, in California, they got a thing they call blood in, blood out. You know, you got to shed blood, somebody's blood to get in, and you lose all your blood coming out, you know. And I defied all of that. I went against all of that. And, you know, I mean, one proud moment, but, you know, I, I just basically told them, you know, if you want to, 
uh, murder me, you know, just going out here and get this over with, you know, just go ahead and throw down whoever, you know, however it go, that's the, you know, that's the end of it. So, you know, you know, they didn't, you know, they didn't bother me. Cause, you know, I mean, not boasting, but I had a pretty good following. A lot of people, you know, was there supporting me, you know, all the way through all that madness I was doing. And strangely enough, quite a few supported me when I made the choice to just leave everything alone. You know, they say, hey man, you know, you done been part of this, you know, this for a long time, you done done a lot, man. And, you know, and you deserve the opportunity to try to go home. You know, so I basically left alone, you know, but, uh, you know, you know, like my prayer was, you know, just, hey, get me out of here. <laughs> and then, you know, like I say, uh, God, <laughs> God thoughts are not mine, his ways are not my ways. And I was, you know, instead of getting another three years and I, I got a five and that, you know, I mean, that, you know, that broke me all the way down, you know, not, you know, you know, like emotionally, you know, and it, you know, it did something to my faith at that time to, you know, it jarred, I mean, it jarred me, mm -hmm. it really jarred me, you know, but then I... Did you feel like God let you down? I felt like I was let down, stepped on, booted in the butt, all of that, you know, but then, you know, I was... You know, I you know, like I said, I, I reflect a lot. So I start thinking, well, maybe, you know, God intend for me to be here for the rest of my life. So I changed my prayer, and I say, Father, you know, like I changed my prayer in 2016. And I said, Father, uh, I don't know what you want from me, but it doesn't matter, you know, uh, where what environment you choose to keep me in, you know, it, it, no, it doesn't matter. I'm going to do your will, but, you know, that you know I have limitations and I'm tired of this environment. Don't keep me in here, you know, in this environment too long. Just, you know, just, you know, call me home, bring me home. You know, I'm tired of, you know, I'm tired of it. Just bring me home, you know, and I don't care, you know, what, you know, what, you want to do with me? Hey, if I'm gonna be on this side of all the rest of my life, I'm gonna be doing your will. You know, you know, like it wasn't about, you know, asking him to release me, you know, let me go any, uh, anymore. You know, I just say, hey, just you know, just let your will be done in my life. Period. You know, let your will be done, and I'll be uh, all right with that. So, so from what I'm hearing from your testimony, it was at that moment that. Your heart actually changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your your perception changed. My the way I view God changed because you know like it wasn't a, you know more about what I wanted like going home and stuff which I wanted I really wanted you know but I'm saying okay if that's not your desire for me you know, that's not part of your will then uh, whatever your will is just you know just let it be done but. Understand, I don't want to be here for another 20 years, 10 years, five years. If you're willing for me to be here, I do it all the way up till you call me home. And I hope it's not long that you call me home. Mm -hmm. and that was 2016. I went back to the board in 2018, um, January 2018, and I was found suitable for parole. You know, they, you know, they found me suitable for, for parole. And oddly enough, it, like I had to go in there and tell him I actually did the murder, you know. Uh, and you know, and like I said moments ago, if God is my witness. He can snatch the breath out of my body this second. I was not the trigger man on that. In fact, I didn't even, I, I, I didn't touch the victim, you know, but I did, did the time for it, you know. So do you feel like you, know, you was treated unfairly with how they handled your case? What I, you know what I really believe? Had I been on beat all along, I wouldn't have been in that situation. That's what I believe. And I'm not totally innocent. I done hurt a lot of people, you know. I just didn't hurt that person. Mm -hmm. I hurt a lot of people, you know. So I think I got not what I had coming because I did a whole lot more time than I ever had, than I think I had coming. But, you know, like I say, you know, when you, or out there in the world and you're doing all these things, man, you know, you don't think about the consequences. 
And every time you do something uh, there in this world, you know, in society that's criminal, you hurt people. You know, you hurt people. But some of us have been so hurt ourselves all our lives that we don't mind hurting people because we want other people to feel what we feel. You know, because I spoke with uh, youngsters up in the prison system that, man, them, but they got some horror stories, man. Horror stories. And that you can see why an a immature mind would carry out that type of crime and, 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 and think like that because, you know, like they're so young when they come in, 16, 17 years old, 350 years of life, all kind of crazy sentences. Mm -hmm. You know, like when you hear their story, you know, and how Fred, you know, okay, they got a hard exterior, but in, inside, you know, they soft, soft, you know, you know, well, they not soft, they just uncertain, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty there. And, you know, like you talk to these kids, you know, hey, like they, like anybody else, it's just that they have a, a whole different perspective on things. And when people have treated them so bad, you know, out there, you know, parents, grandparents and stuff, siblings, you know, neighbors, but, you know, people just treat them any kind of way, that damage your child. That damage them, man. You know, like they may not mean, and it could be from the time they young, small, you know, they could have been abused sexually, you know, whatever the situation is. It, you, I mean, it leaves scars, man. And hurt people actually hurt others. Anytime you hurt somebody, you know, there's a 99% possibility for them to hurt somebody else somewhere down the line. So, you know, like, uh, you know, when kids be hurt and, you know, stuff, they act out, man. And I done spoke to uh, many of them. You know, a lot of them, I done got to step out of gangs and all that. But the thing, man, is like, when you hurt them, they want revenge. Mm -hmm. That's all they know because that's what street teach them. So until you can, like, sit them down and really talk to them, because for the most part, a lot of them kids come up in there and they have homeboys on the street. And a lot of times they don't look out for the guys that come in. You know, they might, well, man, so-and-so in there uh, touch base with him and he'll look out for you once you get there, right? And you may not land at the same prison where that yeah. person is. You know, you may land at another prison and you don't got no kind of uh, uh, resources, no kind of support, you know? And you, you know, and you know, like you normally dig in at that time, you know, and you just say, okay, if this is the way it is, I'm, you know, you know, like you dig in, you know, like you accept everything and just go with it. You're going to survive. Yeah, you, know, you go into survival mode, you know. But you know, like, uh, and, hey, like I say, man, there's a lot of them kids, man, that they're not as bad as people think, you know. But and, you know what, like you take a take a dog, man, and you starve that dog, you know, you just starve him, you know, you don't feed him, you know, the other time you kick him and all that stuff, every time you kick him, you know, you just try, you know, you stomping on him, you know, uh, well, sooner or later, man, if you can muster up enough strength, he gonna try to bite, <laughs> he gonna try to bite you because he tired of being hurt, you know, and that same thing with a uh, human being, you know, when you, like, when you don't hurt him, to the point, you know, where they got nowhere else to turn, they strike back. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes striking back is ugly. And you know, in society you don't really see it like that. Oh, he just a little bad this, he a little bad that. Mm -hmm. But for people to turn that way, you know, they have to do a, a, a little bit more research, you know, in, into their situation. What were they like, like that caused them to turn into that rabbi, you know, that rabbi dog, you know, mm -hmm. what did they go through? You know, what were the circumstances that, you know, that brought them to that point in their life, you know? And that's where you have to go with a lot of them kids because, I mean, they scarred, you know, there's no two ways about that. They're scarred, but you have to understand how they got all that scarring, you mm -hmm. know? So you begin to get to the core of the issues then you can understand, man, what it's gonna take to help them to get past all the, you know, the brutalness that have occurred to them in their lifetime. 
And I worked with youngsters inside for a long time to the point that I was a uh, part of a program there. Uh, I won't say the name of it because it's you know, I mean, you know it's a very 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 good program, but it was uh, initiated on the streets, you know, out here, in, you know, society. You know, they had counselors and a lot of people coming in to work with prisoners, like one on one, you know, in group settings, mm -hmm. and they done good jobs. I worked for them, and uh, you know, it's a lot of counselors that couldn't connect with a lot of the prisoners, you know, because they didn't have the experience, you know, right. they, you know, they hadn't gone through the experience. Right. And I was part of the class and I started talking with some of the cats in there and I was able to like reach them. So what they did, they gave me like an office, man, in the little building that I worked in, you know, working in. And uh, like my, you know, my position was a counselor, but I functioned as a counselor, you know. You were able to relate with them. I was able to relate to the kids. Mm -hmm. Because I had, you know, I've been been where they've been, man. And I did a lot of things what they did. You know, so I was able to uh, connect with them and things, you know. Mm -hmm. for, for 39 years. Mm -hmm. Earlier in your testimony, you were speaking concerning that voice mm -hmm. um, that you would hear and you would know it, not even realizing who the, vo the voice was. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe the Bible referred to it as a, a still small voice. It's very light, you you know, and and um, the people um, through your testimony, um, perhaps they may be able to begin to recognize that voice. Now, hey, 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 that's God. Hey, because a lot of times when you're talking about God, it's so much uh, a fabrication um, when dealing with, with with, 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 with with what people call God so they are not able to recognize him because of the way they did yeah um, I know the scripture declares uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind yeah you know uh, let the mind that was in Christ be also in you yeah. it goes on to speak about casting down the thoughts and the imagination that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God and this is real. And um, uh, perhaps through your testimony and through your 39 years of uh, ex experience, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you can reach somebody or, or some, some young man or, or, or father or son, you know, and, and, and they be able to grab a hold to that still small voice and don't have to go through the process in which you had to go through as well as I had to go through because you did 19 years more than what I did. I know he connected with me, man, with that voice because this happened every time I was finna do something, man, that was uh, unlawful or was just outright down and dirty on the inside. You know, mm -hmm. that little voice would come and say, "Look, man, you know, you know, you know just you know, I mean, not just the voice, but the the image, you know, that that conjured up in your mind. You know, it's like okay, you finna wreck." And they give you like a little brief mental vision yeah. of what this wreck is gonna be. Yeah. You know, you're not gonna like this, buddy. <laughs> you know, you're not gonna like this. You know, and you know, but that that's the way it was, you know, brought to me. Yeah. I don't know how it may come to anybody else, but I do know uh you you know, you as a child and he kinda of touch you. But it's whether or not you recognize the touch and whether or not you're willing to gravitate toward that touch and listen. So do you believe that um, um, one of the journeys in which you you, you endured was, was based at the end of the day because of your actions was the chastising of the Lord? Yeah, I was disobedient. And you're not going to get my attention by being soft and right. nice. You know, you got to put my foot in the coals in the fire, you got to burn me. I got to feel that, you know. I got to feel that, you know, and he knew that, you know. And I, I mean, you know, when I, uh, you know, was up on death row overflow, man, I I hadn't, I hadn't thought about change. I wasn't changing. In fact, I was evolving into a worse creature. And he knew that I was in the, you know, I mean, he put me in the worst place in California prison. The worst 
place, not once, but twice. Mm -hmm. Folsom, San Quentin. And I went, so, you know, I mean, I was so convinced that I would be gassed that I had uh, begun to research what cyanide capsules do to the human body. I had actually got some uh, some material and I was reading up on cyanide, you know, how long the gas flowed in the chamber and how long you had to hold your breath to survive it. And that, it was impossible, you know, it was impossible. But that's the extent I went because I was sure I was gonna be there. I mean, without doubt in my mind, I was gonna be there. Because why would they have me up there long before I have a trial, you know? It just didn't make sense to me. Right. You know? Amen. So um, what would you say to somebody that feels stuck in a game designed to get out, but, you know, blood in, blood out, you know, what kind of words of encouragement would you give them? Because it was God that did it to yeah, you. Yeah, it's not impossible to to uh, get yourself out of there, man. You know, I mean, of course you got to be careful. Yeah. You really have to be careful, but, you know, it's not impossible to get out. And you just have to, man, learn to trust in something other than yourself or, uh, you know, or those around you who want to keep you stuck. You know, you just got to, you know, you got to trust something, uh, you know, bigger than you are, yeah. high power. Amen. We, 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 we bless God for this chance and this opportunity for you to, to give your testimony. Uh, uh, Mr. Edward Moten, uh, or also was known as Sekou in the system. Yeah. Uh, walk some of the deadliest prison halls and a man in the United States of America mm -hmm. and if God saved him God can also save you still small voice listen to him some people may call it your conscience yeah. <laughs> amen listen to him amen uh, we thank you for, 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 for not counting the robbery or you know, to, to uh, share your testimony with, with us here at Jesus Everything Ministries. And, um, uh, also, um, if, say for instance, somebody wanted to contact you, do you have some kind of email or some kind of way that they can uh, 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 contact you? Yeah, they can contact you and get my email from you. Okay. Yeah. So now I need to get your email. Mm -hmm. Okay. We 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 because you know with a powerful testimony like that, thirty nine years, you know, um, some people ain't even live that long, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So, a, a, a man that again, his name is Mr. Edward Moten. Uh, if God can deliver him, he can deliver anybody. Amen. This concludes our broadcast. Stay tuned for our uh, next broadcast, same place, same channel next week. In Jesus' name, we love you. Amen. Amen.